in Boots by Angela Carter. An adult version of the well-known nursery story with Andrew Sachs as Puss, Mick Ford as the hero, Jill Lidstone as the heroine, Doris Hare as the hag, Alan Melville as Pantaleone, and Francis Jeter as the delectable Tabs. Puss in Boots. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good, good day to you. And I hope you enjoy the show as much as we enjoy... What? What's the big joke? Never seen a cat before, is that it? Never been addressed as an equal by a cat before? <laughs> and is it any wonder? Well, I dare say that... You've never met a cat like me. Feline and proud, ladies and gentlemen. Felis domesticus by genus. Uh, that is, for those of you who don't speak Latin, a short-haired domestic ginger. In short, a marmalade cat male. Oh, male. <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> this handsome, furred and whiskered person standing here before you has much to be proud of. Uh, proud, for a start, of his white shirt front or dicky dazzling the eye, uh, forming an elegant uh, formal contrast to the orange, tangerine and amber tessellations of the rest of my coat. My pelt, my brilliant uniform, which is as fiery to the eye as is the suit of lights worn by the matador. <laughs> Such a Tom as I may well be proud, too, of his bird entrancing eye and more than military whiskers. Proud to a fault of my superbly musical voice. When I break into impromptu song at the spectacle of the moon above Bergamo, my native city, scene of the events about to befall, when I spontaneously serenade the moon above Bergamo, all the windows in the square fly open. When the poor players set up their stage in the square, they think themselves lucky if the parsimonious bergamots toss them a few paltry pence. But I, when I start to sing, oh, how liberally my grateful public rewards me with deluges of pails of the freshest water. Often they dower me with new laid... Well, fairly new laid eggs, and the succinctly ripest of the tomato crop. Sometimes even slippers, shoes. Take that, you catawine fiend! And that! Oh, boots, a pair of boots. What generosity, what a tribute, what a splendid gift. Fine, high leather boots, polished so brilliantly I can see my face in them. <laughs> Uh, hi there, puss. You're looking good tonight. Good. Mmm, <laughs> such boots. I wonder... Mm, will they fit me? <laughs> oh. Oh. When blessed peace fell on the square outside my lodging and all the disturbed bergamots had gone back to bed, I looked out of the window to see what had become of my boots... And there, below me, to my infinite astonishment, the very strangest sight I ever beheld. Perfect fit. Perfect. There was a cat. Presumably the perpetrator of the ghastly serenade that had moved me to felinicidal violence. A great big ginger tom of formidable size and length of tail, engaged, of all things, in pulling on over his hind paws those very boots that I had just before in my fury hurled at him. Hey, puss, what are you up to? I uh, fit like a glove, sir. Merci. Merci? Why does he thank me in French? It's the only language in which you can purr, sir. Hmm. You strike me as a, a cat of parts. Let's see how you can climb in those boots. 
climb up to my balcony. Oh, well, a nice Rococo facade to the place. Uh, Rococo is a piece of cake for a cat, sir, either booted or barefoot. With that, the remarkable creature proceeded to scale the exterior of my lodgings. First, he rose up on his hind legs to his full height, which I judged to be some three or four feet. Three feet, eleven inches. Call it four foot, not including my tail, that is. You never get it right. Now, let's be precise, just this once for the record, OK? Can we attempt, perhaps, to be scrupulous, tough as it is on you? Listen to the way he speaks to me, as though I were a child and he were my nanny. Truly, since I first met him, I could hardly call my life my own. I... I... Here, I say, you're going to leave me halfway up to the balcony, are you? Going to leave me here all night, are you? While you complain and whinge and moan, when all you have you owe to me. You're going to abandon me hanging here, are you? Ah, what will happen to your blooming story then? Hmm. Very well. With a sinuous ripple of marmalade muscle... Nice touch. ...he set his forepaws on the carved pate of a curly cherub that decorated the lower part of the facade, and, not one whit discommoded by the boots which he had donned, he brought his back paws up to meet them. Then... First paw forward... <laughs> ...to the stone nymph's tit. A left paw down a bit. Uh, ah, this satyr's bum should do the trick. Ah... Uh, Ah, nothing to it once you know how. Ah, I was born to acrobatics, born to them. <laughs> and very, very often have I performed, in return for a bit of salt cod or the Pope's nose off a goose, to the applause of all, a perfect back somersault, whilst holding a glass of vino in my right paw and never spill a single drop. Not one drop? I see the young man is impressed by my talents. I forbear to inform him, therefore, that, uh, to my shame, I never yet attempted the famous death-defying triple somersault that is the greatest trial and test of such ambitious acrobats of the style of I. <laughs> ah, the young man welcomes me in through the window with a friendly chuck under the chin. Amazing performance. And offers me, polite as anything... A sandwich? Roast beef. Just how I like it. Lean, moist, pink, easy on the mustard. Mm. Mm. <laughs> but all the time I plied the cat with sandwiches, mm. I pondered how to get my boots back. A snifter of brandy, perhaps. Uh, oh, I won't say no, sir. <laughs> I have a great liking for a spot of ardent spirits. Pick up the taste in the vintners. <laughs> Hmm. I started out in life as a cellar cat, right here in the city of Bergamo. <laughs> One fine day, curled up in an empty barrel, overcome with fumes, nodded off. Next thing I knew, woke up in Genoa. Took service as a ship's cat, learned to roll my R's in Marseille, to cat a wall in Spain. Ah, it's been a full life. You, uh, fill the glass right up the top, sir. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, keep out the cold. <laughs> Chilly tonight, sir. Winter draws on. Oh, I've got to drop more of that. <laughs> when I saw the way the cat knocked back the brandy, I realised my plan to render him insensible and then remove my boots was inappropriate. I noticed he was examining my appearance extremely closely. By your coat, I see you're a military man, sir. Cavalry, eh? I, uh, uh yes, uh, I, uh... Oh, past tense, is it? Was a military man? Ah, oh, when was you cashier, sir? Another beef sandwich. Oh. I ate it already in anticipation of your invite. Cards, was it? Or women? Or a combination of both, plus perhaps dueling and the juice, sir? <gasps> oh, how does it earn its living now? I saw I could keep no secrets from this cat. To be perfectly frank with you, puss... I go in for a little card sharping, a little gaming, a little bit of uh, this and that, you understand? <laughs> and I live simply in these lodgings here, and I have but the one pair of boots. Which you so kindly, so very kindly gave to me. Oh, and I shall cherish them always. And in order to repay you, I shall move in with you. What? Oh, don't you ever feel the need of a valet? A, a, a valet? A valet. A valet? Yeah. A touch more brandy to seal the bargain. A valet. <laughs> Do you know, I can see all manner of ways in which you'd make the 
perfect valet, Puss. Ah, perfect. Ah. <laughs> Your health. <laughs> and I dare say the master and I have much in common, for he's proud as the devil. Say that again and smile. Touchy as tin tacks. Swords or pistols. As lecherous as licorice. <gasps> in short, as quick-witted a rascal as ever changed his shirt. So... Puss got his post at the same time as his boots, and then it was busy, busy, busy. It was Figaro here, Figaro there, I tell you. Figaro upstairs, Figaro downstairs, and oh my goodness me. <laughs> this little Figaro can slip into my lady's chamber, smart as you like, at any time of the day or night. For what lady in all the world of any age, complexion or disposition could say no to my advances? To the passionate, indefatigable, yet a toujours discreet attentions of a marmalade cat? Ah, Oh, shut off. Booger off. Get the hell out of it, you miserable cat! Get the hell out of it yourself, you old hag. You don't come in till later. Anticipated your cue again. Achoo! Although I felt that the servant had chosen the master rather than the more conventional whereabout, I soon found myself wondering how I could ever have managed without him. He was a valet beyond price. Is that why you don't pay me, sir? Don't I share all that I have with you? Which means all that I steal. Ah, so you've brought home some breakfast. Where is it? Let's see. An orange, a loaf, and what's that you're hiding behind your back? Come on, let's have it. Come on. A herring. The master chopped up this herring very fairly in order to make two servings. For first he cut the head off, and then the tail, and popped the meaty bit in between into the frying pan. For he never could get it into his thick skull that a cat's not choosy as to whether its breakfast is cooked or raw. So, while he was slicing his bread... Puss! Well, share and share alike, sir. Ain't I left you the head and the tail? I could scarcely escape the notion, sometimes, that as soon as my new valet had insinuated his way into my life, I myself had lost complete control of it. But as soon as we stepped into the casino together, I would forgive him anything, for a cat may move with impunity from one lap to another. Why, whom do we have here? Of all things, a cat? Puss, puss, pretty puss, come on. I never go anywhere without my mascot, my lucky charm, my uh, portable good fortune. Why, puss, my goodness me, you do like to be stroked and petted, don't you? Yes, you do. Ace, a king, a ten, and a queen. Got it. If he was an invaluable extra pair of eyes at a card game, he performed a rather more dramatic function when it was a game of dice. Oh, the poor creature can't resist it when he sees the dice roll. Mistook them for mousies, didn't you? You silly old thing. <laughs> and after he scoops me up, all limp-spined and stiff-legged as I am, playing the cat idiot, and he chastises me, then, oh, who can remember how the dice fell in the first place? Ah, heaven smiles on me tonight, a double six! Oh, and we had, besides, less um, gentlemanly means of support to which he was forced whenever. Banned from the tables again, damn it! And my cat too, my little lucky cat. What do you mean, especially the cat? At such times as these, when the cupboard was bare as his backside, uh, when, in short, the poor soul had been forced to pawn his drawers... <laughs> You must know that all cats have a Spanish tinge. Down to the square we'd go, and there I'd do the Spanish dance I'd learnt in Catalonia. Stamping the ground in my boots. Ole!
So Puss and his man rubbed along famously together and all went right as ninepence until... Until, alas! With one smile, she conjured the heart out of my bosom. When I first saw her smile, it was as if this heart of mine, this frequently abused, rarely if ever seriously touched organ in my bosom, my heart, my heart sprouted wings that instant and fluttered across the square to hover around her like a butterfly just out of the chrysalis, tenderly, tremulously. Until the man goes and falls in love. 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 And needs must he choose to fall in love with the single individual most inaccessible woman in all Bergamo. In love with her at first sight of her smiling face. And that face in itself the most uniquely unlikely sight in the whole city. I am the wife of Signor Pantaleone. I am young and beautiful, and it is my misfortune to have been married against my will out of the schoolroom as payment for bad debts to a bald, gouty miser whose red nose bristles with hairy warts, a grotesque and sinister ancient old enough to be my father, my grandfather, a man as jealous as he is incompetent, who keeps me locked up like a holy statue and scarcely lets me see the light of day. No, no, be fair. Don't I let you have a full hour every evening at your bedroom window? One full hour? What if you do have to keep a sack over your head the while, so though you can look out, nobody can look in at you? Oh, I don't display my prized possessions to the public. I don't waste them on any old Tom, Dick or Harry. Oh, oh, oh no. For one hour, for one hour only, at the tenderest time of dusk, in the obscure light of early evening, then he allows me, half hidden by the curtains, to open the shutters and look down on the busy doings of the square. The dancers on ropes, the women selling cabbage and watermelons, the hurly-burly of life from which I am in exile. I can look out, provided I am securely tied. Oh, yes. I have her on a string. Sometimes I saw the open window, like the dark mouth of a cave, but I never saw you. No. Not until... I even let her go to Mass on Sundays. Yes. On Sunday mornings, very early, when only the most godly venture out, he allows me out of the house for a brief interview with my maker. Although you would think my husband more a Turk than a Christian by the way he makes me parcel up in veils. And, of course, I'm never permitted to venture out alone. Who knows what you might get up to then, eh? Young women. Oh, young women. Cunning as monkeys. So, to police my wife's piety, I employ as her constant companion a trusted lady of mature years who has been long in my employ. I am her governess. She is my wardress. And so it came to pass, as how the lovely wife of Signor Pantaleone was on her way to Mass, and my master glimpsed her face by accident one morning. One Sunday morning. It was so early of a Sunday morning that for those of us who go to bed as late as my man and I, it was still night time. We'd played at cards so late, made such a killing at the tables that the pious ones were already making their way to church through the cold, dark fog as we went home. Our pockets a chink with ill-gotten gains and our guts a sweetly a gurgle with champagne. Hip! Out of the front door of Pantaloon's mansion comes two women. An old woman? Filthy call this morning. Filthy fuck. Black as a bucket this morning. Filthy, filthy. The other, a tall, slender figure like a stem of Narcissus, but all wrapped up in black. She making a graceful and stately progress, though all muffled in crepe like a morning door knocker. 
And I, having had, I must admit, a couple... Oh, Puss! Good morning! ...thinks I'll exercise myself with a game of tag with the dangling fringe of a shawl. <laughs> Does Pussy want to play? Filthy cat! I can't abide... Ah, shoo! Get away, you filthy cat! Ah, shoo! Oh, take no notice of my governess, Puss. Her nostrils tickle at the flick of a whisker. But as for myself, I'm very fond of cats. Do you know my tabs? My stripy tabs? Hmm? Oh, my. What a handsome cat you are. And so very, very friendly. Oh, does he like his ears tickled? Just here. Is that the ecstatic spot? And then I couldn't help myself. Somersault! A double somersault! Wow! But whatever have you got on your hind feet? And so she drew her veil aside to see. Puss in boots! <laughs> when she drew back her veil, suddenly it was May morning. <laughs> the beast. Put it down. You don't know where it's been. And come down with your veil this instant. I don't want any of the rag tag and bobtail to see you. And quit dawdling. Come along. Oh, don't pull so. Oh, oh. you're bruising my arm. Oh. Oh. Oh, oh, nasty nip in the air all of a sudden. How cold it is and dark now that she's gone. She has taken all the promise of spring with her. And so my master fell in love. Head over heels. Positively the double, nay, possibly even the triple somersault of the heart, eh? Without a safety net. Without a partner. She doesn't even know your name. She is a princess imprisoned in a tower, remote and shining as Aldebaran, chained to a dolt, guarded by dragons. By one dragon, or rather a dragoness. When I sit here, at the window of my room, I can see her house across the square. The locks, the bolts, the barred windows. I sit and sit and gaze and gaze. Oh, the sweet tyranny of love. Until that moment once a day when I can make out her vague shape like the moon behind clouds. Oh, hark at him, <gasps> babbling on about the tender passions. Has he come to this? He, the witty and ingenious lecher who went through all the novices in the entire convent? Puss passing in and out the cloister with notes, roses, boxes of chocolate, etc., 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 until my very whiskers smelt of incense? Is he reduced to impotent yearning? The notorious rake who had the mayor's wife under the table at the conclusion of the mayor's banquet while they served the Madeira? This... Cynic. You only want her because you can't have her, you spoilt brat. The poor girl might just as well live in a bank vault as in the finest mansion in Bergamo. You don't know the combination to a safe. And speaking of money, sir, you should know that we're running a mite short on funds. <laughs> Temporary cash flow problems, sir, which would easily and uh, speedily be resolved by a visit to the gaming table. Uh, no, Puss, not today. It's nearly half past four. She'll open her windows presently. And perhaps today the hag will accidentally agitate the curtain as she picks at a pimple. She may even dislodge the curtain sufficiently to let me see the lady's hands. Her hands. All that could be seen of her. White hands. Like lilac on a coffin. Oh, enough to make you queasy. And then, an early night, tomorrow, up bright and early, to mass. Thank God for Sunday. Or would you believe it, the reprobate has now taken to attending church regular as prunes. Perhaps tomorrow, if we sit in the pew behind her, I shall manage, when we kneel, to touch the hem of her dress. Look, a 
glove. Hers. She left it lying on the pew. How do you know it's her glove and not the hag's glove? Because it's so little, such tiny hands. But see, long fingers, and it smells sweet. Her perfume, exquisite, scented hands, hands to caress a man, to console him. And all day long he babbled these and similar maudlin sentiments, sufficient, as they say, to make a cat laugh. And soon our common purse is flat as a pancake, for this newfound, unrequited passion of his has suddenly afflicted him with scruples. I'll never load the dice nor palm a card again. I'll keep my hands from picking and stealing. She, she'd never look at a cheat or a thief. So my master is in a fair way to ruin us both by neglecting his business due to the unsatisfied ravages that love is making upon his constitution. Now, since my observation of the human species has led me to opine that love is nothing but desire sustained by unfulfilment, I therefore conclude that. If I can, by guile and cunning, affect a physical、uh, consummation of this young man's debilitating passion, he'll forthwith be right as rain in two shakes, and next day, tricks as usual, and Puss and his man soon solvent once again, which at the moment very much not, sir. Now, this Tabs to whom the young lady had referred. Turns out to be the house mouser her miserable husband employs, a sleek, spry, short-haired domestic tabby of the feminine gender. <laughs> Greeting from a newfound friend.、Mm-hmm. I tell you straight, the young missus could do with a bit of what you've just given me. Oh yes, that'll put the roses back in her cheeks, all right.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, poor lonely lady, as she is, tied for life to that gore-bellied old doddera, lean and slippered, eyes like a boiled cod, only not half so appetising. With his pot leg and his nose going drip, drip, drip like a forty tap, and the hands of his clock always at half past six. Do you get my meaning?、Mm-hmm. I see you get my meaning.、Mm-hmm. And parsimonious, you wouldn't believe, my dear. 
Does he, Budget, for so much as a scrap of anchovy for yours truly? Does he, Elle? Keeps me on short commons for the sake of the mousing, grasping old skin flint as he is. Mm, my poor Shirley. Mm. Yeah. If it wasn't for the young lady, oh, bless her heart, slipping into the kitchen to smuggle me the odd chicken wing, knuckle of mutton, the backbone of addock, I'd be the skinniest tabs in all Bergamo. Instead of the glossiest, plumpest, brightest-eyed mm. little... Go on, I've met your sort. Ooh. <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> oh, she's a lovely lady, the missus. Lovely, but... Oh! Governess of ours. Mm, the governess, the hag, the dragoness. Apart mm. from her generally unattractive personality and repulsive appearance, she and I never hit it off, not really. Mm. See, as soon as ever she sniffs so much as a whiff of me, she's off. A tissue, a tissue. Veritable paroxysms. Mm. Of course... I used to love to lie and wait for her behind the parlour door, all curled up on her pillow if I got the chance, just to tease the old girl. <laughs> <laughs> but then she started up such a clamour about her allergies and the torments I caused her. Got to get rid of the cat, she said. Talked about popping me in a sack and taking me to the river. Murderous old cow. She never did. She did oh. so, but the young lady put her foot down, told the ag if she didn't give over, she'd tell the old one how the ag scrapes the whitewash off the privy wall and uses it to powder her horrible old face with. Oh, they're two of a kind, the pantaloon and the ag. Mean as hell. Mm. He'd have had her out on her ass for chronic thievery for that before you could say Jack Robinson. So then the ag piped down. Oh, that young lady. She saved my life. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, many's the time we sneak a game of unt the cotton reel and jump on the handkerchief together when we get the chance. When she's with me, the ag leaves her alone. Yes, I would say... We are the only ray of sunshine in one another's lives. Mm, till you popped up out of the cola like a good deed in a naughty world, Mr. Marmalade. <laughs> <laughs> well, what say we hatch a plot to antler the old one, darling Tabs? Oh, you Oh, now you're talking! <laughs> Do you know, would you believe, that I never, ever... Heard her bed springs rattle, not since the poor thing's wedding day. Oh. Not so much as a single twang. Oh. To him, she is no more than his most prized possession and a bargain too. Got her cheap off her father due to a mortgage falling in. <sighs> but antlering is easier said than done, me old cock, me ginger winger, me Kim Tam Tom. Oh. All day and every day, he sits in his counting house, counting out his money, and doesn't budge an inch from his securities. And he keeps his what you might call tabs on her. <laughs> Even when she's with me, would you believe? He keeps a string tied all the time from his great toe to the lady's ankle, so she can't move an inch without him knowing. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. <laughs> oh, just check up on the girl. Oh. He sits in his counting house all day and every day. I tell a lie. Silly on me. Wednesdays. Of course he clears out just the one day a week, Wednesdays. Then he forsakes his wife and coffers to ride out into the country and extort grasping rents from starveling tenants, since he won't trust a bailiff to do the job for him. But that one day a week, he shoots so many bolts on her. And bars so many bars. And chains up the doors, he's locked and barred. That the house becomes a veritable, impregnable fortress. Not to be taken by force, that's for certain. But perhaps by guile and stealth, the well-known specialities of the feline kind? Even so. Inside this maximum security prison, there's the dreadful guardian of the angel. Ah, 
Oh! The hag, who is impervious to our furry charms, Tabs. You get from under my feet, you pestilential feline. I'll have your horrible stripe pine for death. Go on, get him, get him. Whoa, whoa. Problems, problems, problems. <laughs> Yet, dear Tabs, see how even here in the coal hole my ingenuity rises to this challenge. And not only your ingenuity. Hmm? <laughs> My dearest Tams, do you think if I procured a letter to your mistress from my handsome and charming young master, you could slip it to her. Oh, what's your language? Drop <laughs> <laughs> these boots. Since my eyes were first dazzled by your beauty. As by the rays of the sun, dear lady. Oh, God. Ah, well, that's not the high road to the rumpling of the bed cover, sir. She's got one ninny between them already. Do you think she wants another? When I want your advice, Puss, I shall ask for it. Oh, yes. Mm. Mm. Of course. <laughs> what are you doing on my knee? You're covered in coal dust, yeah. too. <clears throat> Get down at once. <clears throat> Get down! You're covered in cold dust and you're, you're jogging my arm. You'll make me blot the paper. There! Oh, now look what you've done. And never did a missive more deserve to be blotted. Poetry. is descended to poetry. Must the prime symptom of love be always softening of the brain? I declare, look what you've written. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Yes. Oh, well, tell us she resembles a wet bank holiday Monday. Do you think that'll endear yourself to her? No, 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 no. Where's the true voice of feeling, man? Speak from the heart. Tell her all about yourself. Yes, but, Puss, I'm a little better than a petty criminal, Puss. A, a lecturer. Ah, 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 ah. All good women have a missionary streak, sir. Persuade her she's your salvation and she's yours. My past, my wicked, wicked life. Yeah, I'll be fair, so wicked is laying it on a bit thick, sir. <laughs> but if I could win the love of a good woman, the healing, purifying love of a good woman. Yes. Hmm. A cashiered officer, a card sharp, a profligate, a wastrel, a cruel, heartless seducer. And if I never stooped to theft myself, then I was quite content to let my valet do the thieving for me. Ooh. But then I saw your face, just for a single moment in the square, and for the first time I knew there was such a thing as forgiveness. Your eyes like holy candles, your mouth as if its shape was formed by prayer. And now, can you credit it, I haunt the church and not the brothel. I pass by on the other side of the street from the taverns and the gambling hells. My life has narrowed down to those few sacred hours a week when I can see the veiled angel who will lead me to grace and bliss. Well, oh, my dear Tabs, I never meant to wreak such havoc with a heart when I first smiled to see a booted cat. I'll kiss your signature, you poor soul, and store your letter here, in my bodice, yes, where the hag can't find it. Next to my heart. Oh, the dear, good soul that wrote such a letter. <sighs> I am too much in love with virtue to withstand you. Providing, of course, he's not as ugly as sin, or as old as the hills. Eh, Tabs, dear? Wow. <laughs> the lady's tabby confidant entrusted me with this. Oh, let's have it. Oh, oh. Never would have believed it moved me to the heart. Yet... Yet how can I usefully discuss your passion further without a good look at your person? Oh, I'll serenade her this very evening. Puss, off you go and pawn my sword. Pawn your sword? What do you want to pawn your sword for? What fresh madness is this? Ah, oh, oh, I knew it. I suspected it. he's going to dress up in costume. Oh, the embarrassment. Oh, unbearable. For would you credit it, the poor, lovesick buffoon went and bought the white baggy rags off the back of one of the mountebanks that strut and primp in the square. 
the zany moonstruck loon. He thought he'd score a bullseye if he played Piero. So when she came out to take her nightly airing at just the very busiest hour, out we set across the square. There she is. Do you see her? She looks as if she were dreaming. Dreaming of me, perhaps. But what is she looking at? I, I can't see her. I can just see her eyes above her veil, but... She's I... looking at the sickle moon over Bergamo. Strike up! <laughs> <laughs> She didn't hear a note. I'll try again. Not heard a word. Not turned her head. Never caught hair nor hide of you. Oh, she's lost, quite lost in her own sweet thoughts. You might as well have stayed at home and saved your money. Yeah, I do. Oh, no. <laughs> Up you go. Tell her I'm here. What? Up to her window. Rococo's a piece of cake, you said. That ain't Rococo, that's Palladium. Oh, Mr. Marmalade! Ginger oh. and Joe! Oh. Here I am, up in the gutter! Oh, go on, you can do it! See that bloody great carrier tin by the door, Jack? Just swarm a burlo and dog a tiger to And since my girl was watching me. <clears throat> from loincloth up to these massy pets. Oh, that Doric Colin this carrieted upholds. Ah, never a hand hold nor a foothold on a Doric Colin, damn it! What about a flying leaf? Are you an acrobat or are you not? Oh, take a flying leaf, like Arlequin on wires. Flex your muscles, tense your thighs, and spring! You can make it if you really try, I know you can. Ah, uh, right. <laughs> For my tabs, I'll do it very well. And with one magnificent upward bound. <laughs> I landed on the windowsill. Dear oh. God, what an apparition. Where's the hag? Sped to the privy, seized with a flux. Something she ate. What luck? Luck? I've nothing to do with it. Now, quick as you can, cast your eye directly into the square below, ma'am. What? He knew what of lurks there in the big hat. In white. Ready to sing you an evening ditty. Ah, What's going on? That cat! Scrampus! Discretion is the better part. Straight out of the window I jumped. I can't believe it! But it's not true! He's doing it! He's really doing it! He's done it! The triple somersault! What a cat! What a marmalade! Marvel splendor! The triple accident, performed during that three-storey drop to the ground, uh, performed, I'm forced to admit, in a not entirely voluntary manner, but not a word to tabs. The triple somersault left me exhilarated, if breathless. But did my master so much as witness my triumph, let alone congratulate, did he be blowed? And now I see her eyes turn towards me. How they shine! Come again! To hear, to touch, to kiss, to die With thee again in sweetest sympathy Come again that I may see I sigh, I weep, I faint, I die In deadly pain and endless misery I sit, I sigh, I weep, I faint, I die In 
deadly pain and endless misery. My dear! Back in your box! Bread and cheese? Is there nothing in the house to eat but bread and cheese? A poor pickings today, sir. But it's weeks since you showed any appetite, and I... Did you hear how she called my dear? Is there any more of this uh, excellent gorgonzola? Mm. I need to keep uh, my strength up now. If you want any more gorgonzola, you can go and pinch it yourself. You know where the grocers is. Puss, puss. Oh, don't mind me, sir. You just get on with your supper, sir. But don't you believe that tonight's successful serenade marks more than phase one of the strategy of the siege of Casa Pantaleone? In fact, if uh, if you can do without me for half an hour, sir, I think I'll um, I'll just slip across the square for a uh, tactical conference in the coal hole with my little fifth columnist. Rats, rats! If there's one thing the ag hates more than cats, it's rats. Oh. Allergic to cats, she may be, but with rats, she's plain hysterical. <laughs> Now, my love, if I was to go... We was to go out hunting together and gather up an enormous number of rats, some killed dead, but some we had merely crippled so they could still scamper if slowly, and were we to strew some of these rats around the house, but assemble still more of them in, under, and around the missus's own bed, mm. one... Wednesday morning, mm. after the old fool's gone off about his business. <laughs> and mm. if you and your young man was to be about the place, can you decide? Item one, one house full of rats. Item two, one hag in terror of same. Item three, one young lady confined to her bed for fear of rats. Item four, one lusty young rat catcher to wit you sir in thick disguise uh, perhaps equipped with a luxuriant and aggressive false moustache so that the hag won't recognize you from church this rat catcher plus his intrepid assistant plying for hire in the square tomorrow morning at just the psychologically precise moment as item two issues from the front door of item one howling screeching and allululating <laughs> Myself. I am a nobody but Il Signora Furioso, professionally known as the living death of the rats, the sworn enemy of them and dedicated to stamping out all the genus of the ratos and the mass variety. Have I got the pattern right, Puss? Spot on. The lead us directly to the site of the interstation. Ah! Ah! Oh, God, you leave that cat behind! What? A venture out on an invasion without my assistant, my partner, my pal, my very own ambulant rat trap, my sworn lieutenant in the fight against ratos, domesticos, ratos, ratos, and last but not least, tiny wee mus musculosa! Oh, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it! Just you hear the name, the beast sets me all of a shake! Come quick! Hey, Puss, haven't you ever done it a bit? The house is like a museum of rats. Oh, trust your faithful servant, sir. Have you found a rat catcher? I didn't get out of bed in case I tread on one of the beasts. <laughs> rats are plenty all alive, oh. And there she is, the beauty, up on the bed with the covers up to her chin. And everywhere you look, a heaving sea, ratus, ratus, ratus. Yeah! Curse the rats! Drop the cat! Although, of course, none of the rat eye are the best of health. <laughs> More the atmosphere of a rat casualty ward in here than a rat holiday can. Good <laughs> morning, signora! In a moment, all your prayers will be answered. Allow me to introduce myself. Here, signora, furioso, and this toothed, clawed, vermin exterminator. I'm like some other focus. See, over there, a bus, that big black beast, a pox, puss, a pox! <laughs> Oh, 
watchman at the tie and an army of the beast black is the rat you ever can see lighting up behind it ready to the storm a through ah! shoot oh I'll expire directly you go and recover yourself in the kitchen over an infusion of fire's balsam and don't come back until it's over I can tell the hag is torn between the extreme terror and discomfort of her present situation and loyalty to her employer, etc., etc., etc. What? Leave the young lady alone with her legs unshackled in a bedroom with a man? So the hag dithers and shillies and shallies until I lob her a little brown mouse still twitching with a quick flick of the left paw. It strikes her straight on the chin. I hardly dare to take your hand. Then I must take yours. Darling. My dearest. As if we were made for one another. Come off it, sir. Do you think she thinks you staged this grand charade solely in order to kiss her hand? Oh, and get that false moustache off pronto. Love may not consort with the ludicrous. Perhaps we might remove the hairy evidence of Signor Furioso from your upper lip. Oh, the, the, the false moustache. But there. Is that better? All the better to kiss me with. Oh, too much. <laughs> get a move on you too. Full speed ahead. Do you want the hag to catch you in flagrante? Don't you think we might be more comfortable, uh, prone? Oh, my dearest. Puss, puss, mimic the murder of rats immediately. Ah. Mask the music of Venus with the clamor of Diana. Uh, Tantivy! <laughs> <laughs> And the sheet's been ripped. Oh, such things as took place on my bed, governess. If the mattress could only speak, it would provide such credentials to the courage and capacity of Signor Furioso. And, Signor, how much do we owe you for your singular services? Who, me? Uh, why, no, not a... Uh, not, uh, uh, 100 ducats. <laughs> what, do it for nothing, would you, you honourable idiot? Only 100 ducats? That's the entire household expenses for a month. And worth every penny. Well, wouldn't the rats have eaten us out of house and home by then? Go on, go and fetch the money. No need to mention it to my husband. You can easily spare 100 ducats out of the cash you skim off the housekeeping hag. Can't she, Puss? Ah, tissue! Oh, get this other thing off me! Go away! A hundred ducats! Catch! Or else the cat will cling on to you like a bird, like a tick, like a succubus! So that night we sat down to a supper for which, for the first time in some months, mere circumstances had not dictated the menu, but all honestly bought from shops. Hmm. Fine, I um, eat up, sir. Such a nice escalope de veau and you ain't touched it. Nor the mushrooms neither. Not that I fancy fungi myself, but you've always hitherto relished it. What? You can't fancy it? But you ate like a horse after she smiled at you. Now he picks like a bird after he... I don't understand the human heart, and that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the joke? Share it with Puss. <laughs> And now he's bust out crying. What's got into him? He's sickening for something. <gasps> Could he have picked a germ up from the rats? Ah, oh, still, no point in wasting that bit of veal. I must and will have her forever. <clears throat> oh, I'd 
fairly put me off my supper too. Oh, I see how satisfaction has not satisfied him. I therefore push my plate aside and fall to grooming myself meditatively. I'm usually grimy about the shirt front. Mm, strong flavour of coal dust about my person. How can I live without her? Oh, now you've done so for 25 years, sir. I never missed her for a moment. I'm burning with the fever of love. Oh, then we're spared the expense of fires. I shall snatch her away from her husband and we'll live together. Always. Oh, and what do you propose to live on? Kisses. Embraces. Ah, well, you won't grow fat on that, sir. Though she will, and then there'll be more mouths to feed. I'm <laughs> sick and tired of your foul-mouthed barbs, puss. Oh. Oh, sorry. Sorry I spoke, sir. Pardon me for breathing, sir. My apologies for living, sir. Ha! There's gratitude for you. Ha! Let me out. Open that door. Good riddance. Had your supper, have you? The merest snack. Look, as I saved you, this pig's trotter the missus smuggled me. Oh. For services rendered, she said, and tipped me such a wink. Well, I think I could manage a pig's trotter. Mm -hmm. And she was in ever such a funny mood. First she laughed like a mad thing, and then, all at once she's April with the showers. How she cried. Oh. How can I live without him, she demands, but does not wait for an answer. I must and will have him forever, she declares. And the next breath vows she'll leave her husband. Did you ever hear such things? I heard them just this minute, Tabs. It's plain enough these two speak with one voice the plain, clear, foolish rhetoric of love. <sighs> yes. But only we are smart enough to bring them together. Scheme, Mr Marmalade. Scheme. Tabs, my dearest. And um, slowly recapitulate for me the daily motions of Signor Pantaleone, alias old pantaloon, when he's at home. Well, they set the clock of the Duomo by him, so rigid and regular is he in his habits. Up at the crack. <laughs> he makes a meagre breakfast off yesterday's crusts. Oh, bread's tough this morning. Which he dips to soften them in a cup of cold water. That he drinks cold to spare the expense of a fire. Then bright and early, down to the counting house. Good morrow to my gold. Counting out the money. <laughs> Until a well-earned bowl of water gruel, that is water extravagantly boiled, served hot. Ah, that's the stuff. At midday. His afternoons he devotes to usury. Bankrupt in here. I'm ruined, you devil. A small businessman. There, a weeping widow. <gasps> my starving children, my ruthless orphan. All this he does for fun and profit both. Which puts him in the mood for a luxurious dinner prompt at four. More piping hot water with perhaps a bit of rancid beef in it or a rubber end or some such. He's got an arrangement with the butcher. <laughs> My old bird for his old bird. Oh, take his unsold stock off his hands. Fair exchange. On Friday nights he gets the use of the hag. <gasps> From 4.30 to 5.30, while he airs his young wife at the window... Giving the occasional twitch to my big toe to make sure she's safe and sound a while. He himself adjourns to his strong room to check out his chest of gems, his bales of silk, the Persian carpets he keeps well rolled up and out of sight, since, like the missus, they are too beautiful to waste on the eyes of the oi ploi. Ah, my carpets, my pearls, my diamonds, my collateral. Oh, oh. Then it's early to bed, so as to waste no candles. And sinless slumber in the prospect of another happy today, tomorrow. <laughs> that is his life. Hmm. Just how rich is he? Croesus. Sufficient to support two loving couples? Some mature. <laughs> My sweet, pretty, clever one. <laughs> My soubrette in stripes. <laughs> Susanna to my Figaro and Columbine to my Harlequin. Ma chère. Mm. Chérie. Mm. 
what if, early some uncandled morning, as the old man, bleary with sleep, descends the staircase, blind to all but the peckish anticipation of his bread and water, what if... What if then he were to place his foot on the subfusk, yet volatile fur, of a shadow camouflaged young tabby cat? And topple, topple, topple! Mm. You read my mind, my love! Ah. <sighs> and now, sir, you must raid the Hagganess's store of ducats and set yourself up in all the gear of a medical man, for we are going to be disciples of Hippocrates. What are you up to now? Do as I say, and never mind the reasons. Off you go and fully equip yourself. Um, a black gown, a black bag, a skull cap. Oh, and another dose of facial hair. Yes, a grey beard this time. That'll inspire confidence. Besides, some sugar pills and bottles of coloured water and jars of goose grease. When you've finished with your shopping list... Tomorrow morning, disguised as a doctor, you must stand up proudly in the square for hire. And I, masquerading as your nurse, shall carry the sign. Uh, il famoso dottore, secure the pains are prevented, the lovers are united, etc., etc., etc. <gasps> Is she going to play the invalid? Is that the plot, oh. eh? So I can get into her room again. I'll take her in my arms and, and jump out of the window with her. We now, shall perform now, the triple now, summer now, sort of love, now, even if we now, don't now, outlive it. Now, uh, now. Don't let it go to your head, sir. Just leave well alone and do what I say and things will turn out handy-dandy, sir. Haven't they up till now? Mm, I suppose so. May I presume to ask you exactly when we're to have our game of doctors and nurses? <sighs> Another raw, misty, bleak, angular, comfortless morning, the darkness before dawn... But so dark, you think the dawn will never come. And surely, this winter has lasted all my life. Oh, so cold here out in the square, puss. Nobody about it. <laughs> What's that? <coughs> A client? We didn't prepare for unexpected clients. Uh, let me handle this. Uh, there's no point in passing up a bob or two, is there? <laughs> you got anything for an acting call? Oh, uh, you rub <laughs> this on your chest, mate. <laughs> Ten ducats. <laughs> What a pug! What the hell is this? Gone off, has it? Ten ducats for this? Oh, no, 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 my good man. It ain't never gone off. The miraculous substance in this little tin is uh, a triple distilled ointment uh, prepared from the highly refined uh, 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 lard of the left thigh of the um, exceedingly rare, prophylactically valuable, newly discovered American armadillo. <coughs> Armadildos? What's armadildos got to do with an acting cough? Eh? And what's more, I don't know the look of your whiskers, nor, so help me God, of that long red tail of yours. I think you've got charlatan written all over you. Take back, you lousy angels! Uh, come, come, my good fellow. My assistant trained in Bologna. Crooks! <laughs> Oh, is it a doctor in the house? Doctor, oh, doctor, come at once. Our good man's taking a sorry trouble. Oh, quick! Where's the patient? At the stair foot. Ah. Oh. Are you the doctor? My husband, a fall. Puss, my bag. Puss, you again? Oh. Where's my little mirror? Just hold it to his lips. Dead, is he? Broke his neck, did he? Oh, Where's the key to the counter now? Surely I detect the faintest missing with the glass, enough to give me hope. Oh, Doctor, we must carry him up to bed and make him comfortable. <laughs> the master, nothing loath, pops pantaloon over his shoulder in a fireman's lift, and the entire party repair to the bedroom in two shakes of a bee's wagger. The young lady, pretty as a picture in a morning negligee, and keeping, I notice, a weather eye open on the activities of the hag who's blubbering like a stuck pig to conceal the way she's hovering around the defunct miser and making little darting sallies at his pockets with her thieving hands. She's after the keys to the counting house. Take that. Ouch! Oh, no. Mm. no heartbeat that I can hear. Oh. And when I tap his knee with my little hammer, no reflex. Oh. I hold his wrist and feel no pulse. Oh. And when I slip my hand into his wife's bodice... Not the flicker of an eyelid, dead as a dawn hill. 
It's not a doctor you want for this one, madam. It's an undertaker. Off you go and fetch one, Hag. This minute. Uh, let's just see how much he's worth first. Go on. Just give me the keys to the counter now. I thought thoughtfully remove them from his belt while you went to find a doctor, Hag. See? We'll check out the counting house the minute the cover's nailed down on him. The minute? The instant. Undertaker first, then counting house. Ouch! A blasted cat again. Undertaker first, then counting house. All right, very well. Undertaker first, then counting house. Undertaker first. Darling. Dearest. Get that false beard off. Oh, the bed. Occupied. The floor. Oh. If a veil were to hand, I would now draw it to conceal the embraces of these two young lovers. But as it is, I must ask you to exercise the same discretion as Puss himself, who now opened the shutters and unbarred the windows and slipped out onto the balcony to observe the rosy fingers of the dawn. For during the time we had been busy with Signor Pantaleone, those fingers had painted the sky with a veritable herbaceous border. A lovely morning, full of the joyous beginnings of spring, the voice of the turtle. Watch it, Ginger. Look at the birdies. Delicious. I do believe at last that winter is over and gone. <laughs> oh, can't you smell a green smell, a fragrance of burgeoning things, of quickening? Burgeoning and quickening is right, Ginge. For oh, my love. I do have the most momentous secret to whisper in your ear. A secret? Bend down. <gasps> oh, really and truly? No more than nature's way. But now your rambling days are over, my lad. No more nights on the towers for you. No moonlight serenades. Sing lullabies instead. And henceforward, we two shall sit one on each side of the parlour mantelpiece. As if we were cats made out of china. The household ornaments. Mr. and Mrs. Marmalade. Ah, Puss and his tabby. The genie of the home and the protectors of the hearth. Oh, yes. Well. Ah, serene. My most <laughs> oh, few have worked as hard to achieve the tranquil joys of domesticity as you and I. <laughs> oh, won't you snuggle up a little closer, Tabs? Plenty of room on the windowsill. <laughs> And at just this tender, if outrageous, moment... In comes I, the Undertaker, with a brace of mutes. The mutes, bearing between them a nice country box of elm, good old solid old elm. And what greets our eyes? Why? A handsome young couple, naked as nature intended, stretched out on the carpet and at it, hammer and tongue. Nonsense, Hag. New broom sweep clean. Go and pack your bags. Watch this. Going to turn me out, are you? After what I did with the butcher to put meat in the pot. Thieves, murder, fornication. Indeed, I shall give you the sack, Hag. But I'll stuff it with money first, don't you worry. Yet how can I retain you in my house when your sneezes cause such suffering to my beloved cats? And, Hag, remember, it's my house now. 
and my counting house. For now, I am a rich widow, and here... And with a flourish of the counting house keys, she indicates my bare yet blissful master. Here's the young man who'll be my second husband. <laughs> And so I took my master the quickest way to a happy ending. <laughs> and the young miss is rounding out already. Oh, but my tabs beat her to it, since cats don't take half so much lazy time about bringing their progeny into the world as Homo sapiens does. <laughs> so almost before they've cleared away the wedding breakfast, there's three fine new minted kittens taking their bows. All as marmalade as might be, and each equipped with the snowiest of dickies who tumble in the cream pan and tangle up the missus' knitting oh, kitten. and tumble about the parquet flooring like the born acrobats they are <laughs> and put a smile on every face, especially those of their proud mother and father. <sighs> so, ladies and gentlemen, all is set fair. And may I wish you au revoir. And let me wish you too in parting as follows. That all your wives, if you need them, be rich and pretty. And all your husbands, if you want them, be young and virile. And all your cats, as wily, resourceful and perspicacious as puss in boots. <laughs> In Puss in Boots, dramatised for radio by Angela Carter from her own short story, Andrew Sachs was Puss, Mick Ford the hero, Jill Lidstone the heroine, Doris Hare the hag, Alan Melville Pantaleone, and Francis Jeter Tabs. The Undertaker was Stephen Thorne, the gambler Peter Arne, and the citizen's wife Maddie Head. The play was directed by Glenn Dearman. <laughs>